Hello, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural event in Penn Canada's new online series, Penn by the Book, Authors in Conversation. In this new series, Penn Canada goes coast to coast, bringing our program to our members and to the public across the country. My name is Grace Westcott, and I am the president of Penn Canada. Tonight, author and classicist Colin McAdam talks with poet and classical scholar Jack Mitchell about Jack's retelling of the Star Wars saga in his epic poem, The Odyssey of Star Wars, told in the style of the classical heroic sagas and epics of Greece and Rome. We call tonight's uh, event From Hollywood to Homer because it's a charming and, and, and you might say quirky reversal of expectations to take a high-tech cinematographic, cinematographic blockbuster and retell it in an ancient form, epic poetry, a form that predates the alphabet. Before we get started, let me take a moment to thank storyteller producer and new pen member, Jason Lever, for the Star Wars-like video scroll you saw a few minutes ago. And a bit of housekeeping before we begin, there will be a Q&A at the end, and you can post your questions using the chat function, and we'll, as hosts, we'll get that. Um, you can do that at any point in the discussion, and I will read them out at the end in a Q&A. Tonight, the chat function is ex exclusively for sending your questions in. To keep background noise down, we will all be um, muted and our videos will be off during the presentation. Um, before I introduce Jack and Colin, I'd like to acknowledge that we share the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. We recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and the Inuit people, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to meet, to live, and work on this territory in a journey towards truth and reconciliation. And now to our speakers. As you will have seen on the scroll, Jack Mitchell is a Stanford educated poet and scholar who is currently associate professor of classics at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. He is, as you might imagine, a big Star Wars fan, as are his two young sons. Colin McAdam, studied English and classics at McGill and at U of T, and he received his PhD in English literature from Cambridge. He's the author of prize-winning novels, Some Great Thing, Fall, and A Beautiful Truth. His fourth novel, Black Dove, will be out in 2022. And now I am delighted to turn the screen over to Jack Mitchell and Colin McAdam, Colin, take it away. Thanks, Grace. Great to uh, great to be here. Welcome, welcome everyone uh, to to another episode of Wish You Were Here. Uh, I uh, I think most of you, like me, have probably grown a little too used to this uh, Zoom interface. But I, I have to say, sometimes I'm, I'm missing. Uh, Missing the rooms full of people, um, and uh, uh, hope, hopefully that will happen uh, again sometime soon. Uh, in the meantime, though, I suppose the advantage of, of this is, is that uh, you can all join us from from places uh, far away, uh, maybe uh, other galaxies, indeed, or other planets. Uh, I like to imagine some of you uh, maybe uh, sitting on uh, Tatooine or the Cloud City, having a having a, an exotic drink. I've poured myself a little uh, whiskey, uh, the size of which, uh, it's, it's large, which is another advantage of, of uh, being at home rather than at a venue. I can, I can afford a whiskey that size. <laughs> um, I think Jack, uh, when we spoke to the pen people, um, a few weeks ago, I sensed, and I'm sure you did, a, a sort of a fear among them that uh, you and I, as these earnest classical scholars, would drag this whole conversation down into a, a sort of marsh 
Dragobin Marsh of, of, of spondees and dactyls because we uh, that's apparently how we how we think but uh, we've, we've been uh, beseeched to make this as lively as possible and and uh, I'll rely on you Jack to, to do that uh, um, I should say from the beginning for those uh, who haven't read your your fantastic book um, it, 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 despite being sworn not to be serious, this is a very serious work, I thought. I mean, it has a, a charming cover and, and, a, and it's a, it's a, it seems like a bit of a lark as a concept, uh, but it's, it's, it's serious at every level and, and I really appreciated that. And, and uh, you, you uh, show such attention to detail and, and, and firmly set this within the sort of epic Big tradition that it that it you know, that you that you aim for and 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 do it with such confidence and and uh, and 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 I think uh, beauty and that earnestness that we're meant to avoid. I'm I'm grateful uh, to you for. Uh, uh, I think more than anything, uh, what I felt throughout reading it was was that it's. It's an act of love. Uh, it's clearly uh, a reflection of your love for, for Star Wars and uh, also your love for, for poetry and for classics. Uh, but I think, you know, in a way, most, most charmingly, in a way, I felt your love for your kids coming through somehow. Uh, you know, not, not explicit, but, but I think, you know, at the very least, your love of, of childhood uh, stories and how those shape us. And, you know, so much for me was, was brought alive again, uh, conjured as I, as I read this. And I, uh, I encourage everybody to, uh, to, to read this uh, and, and uh, you know, be surprised by it. Um, I thought that now, Jack, uh, might be a good time for you to, to, to read, just to give everybody a little, a little taste of, of, of what this is, and, and, uh, and we can go from there. How does that sound? Sure thing, definitely. Yeah, well, I'd, uh, I'd uh, not known what passage to pick, but I, I think we, we hit settled on something which, which was, uh, I think it encapsulates a few different aspects of the poem uh, and its relationship to the Homeric tradition. So I'll, I'll read from the end of book one which is uh, the destruction of the planet of Alderaan by the evil Death Star controlled by the evil empire um, under the control of Grand Moff Tarkin, Governor Tarkin, who is the uh, senior imperial officer there. And uh, he does this in order to uh, e extract information from Princess Leia, who is captive uh, on that Death Star, and she's from the planet of Alderaan. So it, I'll just read that passage here, starting with uh, Tarkin's threat to Princess Leia. <clears throat> Choose now, shall peaceful Alderaan be lost through one girl's stubbornness, or shall I pick a military target, one that hides the hidden rebel base from which your fleet is wont to prick us? Make the choice yourself. So Tarkin spoke, and Leia, frightened pale, pondered two courses in her teeming brain, whether to give them Yavin where the base was nestled on a jungle moon, or name the rebels' vacant base on Dantooine. Pondering all this, she gave them Dantooine, to which grim Tarkin, with a slender smile, now there I do believe you, yet my aim is twofold, stamp a rash rebellion out, and also bring the rest of core to heal. Twice have I seen this battle station's blast carve pieces from a planet. Jeddah lies in utter ruin, Scarif seas are boiled. Single ignition blasts were those, but here the full strength shall be tested. Let the core observe the fate of Alderaan and crawl. So speaking, Tarkin gave the cold command to fire when ready. Leia, gasping, fought against the iron vice of Vader's grip. As slow but sure as mud, which ceaseless rains have fed for weeks will scrape the mountainside colliding with a forest, churning through the village. So the operation went of using that great weapon, target lock, the final pause, the final safety check, ignition of the kyber cores, which yield eight hypermatter beams, a livid green as lucid as a pulsar, winding through eight tributaries till the focal point perfects the bright apocalyptic ray. 
as when a skillful prince of yore let fly his bronze-tipped spear when through the battle line the chariots burst like thunder and afar the stricken foe crashed backward to the earth yielding his angry spirit with a shout just so the death star blasted alderaan burrowing through the surface like an egg is cracked in careless hands the vital yolk blending with white the shell in bits that hang together with no purpose so the crust of alderaan now ceased to cup its core here sinking tipped into the molten depths and there blown into orbit scattered far the mass diffused its gravity unhinged the atmosphere is mixed and dissipates the mantle scribbled red against black space the solid core is ruptured and explodes then on the screaming surface oceans drain mountains are dust the cities ripped to bits palaces cabins nurseries monuments a single moment stops the course of time all life at once is suffocated burnt quartered and flayed depressurized and crushed all mammals and all birds all reptiles fish all insects down to microscopic cells call out in terror silenced instantly and little mourned for who shall sing laments when all the mourners perish with the dead poor planet since your system first took shape you'd circled your bright star the eons etched upon your surface unbeholden fair better it were that life had never walked your fields nor swum your oceans than that now its destiny should draw the death star near for life brings death the very elements diffuse and what was once a noble globe shatters forever into nameless rocks colliding in the quiet of the void very nice very nice i loved uh, when when i when i got to that point uh reading it i i uh, i thought a few things i thought number one this guy's this guy's having fun uh which is always great to to as a, as a reader to feel um and i just love the language i love that you know the the egg that's you know ceased to cup cup its core i thought that's uh, you know things like that are lovely and of course everyone uh, Everyone will uh, recognize the epic similes and and uh, all, all all sorts of Homeric devices, which uh, which we can we can get into uh, forthwith. But I I, I thought I thought uh, we could start in terms of my questions with with the question that I find as a writer uh, the most uh, difficult and disheartening and and. Uh, and helpful at the same time, uh, whether I'm beginning a project or, or, or in the middle or ending, um, which is why, why, <laughs> why, why am I doing this? Why am I uh, 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 battling uh, penury? Why am I uh, howling into the void? Why am I uh, wasting day after goddamn day doing this, uh, this thing? Uh, why on earth, Jack, did you write this? Well, I think it gets to the point you made about my kids. Like, uh, it was literally when I was reading a kind of kids version of the whole Star Wars trilogy to my then five and three year old, I guess the five year old, maybe it might have been six. And I, I realized, well, I'm actually in the process of passing on this Star Wars myth. And although I'd always been something of a Star Wars fan, uh, that was when it sort of reactivated, you might say, my, my earlier fandom. And um, and I became much more invested in the story once I realized I had a very direct audience in my own kids. And it made me think, well, this is uh, a potential audience for poetry, not just children, but sort of the whole um, passing on of a myth that would be uh, potentially fruitful for epic poetry. Uh, I tried, um, and I still am proud of my Canadian epic poem that I've, I did in the Homeric style for performance about uh, the Battle of the Plains of Abraham and sort of significant Canadian history. But um, uh, the, the, the difficulty there for an audience is that you're limited you know, to your kind of live audience. Uh, whereas the potential for sort of a written epic to reach a larger group, um, my own uh, kids, but also potentially uh, Star Wars fans and, and other people's kids, you might say, uh, made me sort of embrace the written epic in a way I'd never done before and sort of feel as I was writing it in those grueling hours that you mentioned, that I was potentially trying to reach that specific um, audience and not just children, but, but the wider 
public with an appetite for the epic story of Star Wars. I mean, one of the difficulties for epic poetry, uh, which you touched on, is the sort of the danger that lies in uh, mock epic. And uh, this is a you know, the use of epic to describe things which are not suitable to epic uh, for a sort of comic effect. And that's something that goes way back to the Homeric period itself. There's actually a Homeric mock epic called the Battle of Frogs and Mice in which the, the frogs and mice attack each other and fight just like the Trojans and the Achaeans at Troy. And uh, so that's always a danger lurking in the background is, you know, if you're going to do something in a serious epic style, is it going to be received as a kind of comic take on epic and I thought there was a sufficient sort of serious audience for Star Wars that I could trust the audience to take it seriously and uh, the story itself is you know there's elements of comedy in it but it's still meant to be serious yeah well you handle you handle that so beautifully I think that uh, you you avoid that mock epic ep, ep, mock epic tone uh, really really tastefully I think you know you there there are moments where where uh you know uh uh, hyperdrive or an attach or things like this will will, will, will sneak in and, and it could feel like uh, you know bathos in a way or, or or you know undermining the whole thing but but it for me just contributed to the charm of the thing and 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 also kind of uh, put a little hook in me as a as a as a kid watching these movies for the first time you know that uh I, I, whenever you did that, for whatever reason, it, it sort of yanked me in that direction. Um, uh, well, I, you know, I, I can, I go ahead. I was gonna say, well, that's one of the things about, I think, a traditional mythical uh, transmission in a sort of oral culture is that um, people as listeners are at once themselves in their present moment, but also every sort of instantiation of listener before that, all going back to their own childhood and sitting around hearing the Trojan War for the first time. They will have heard it over and over and over again. And um, so although it helps to have a story like Star Wars people know, I think it's also uh, helpful for a poet because you can make these illusions and trust the audience to know them and, um, and trust them to kind of blend their earlier selves with their present selves that way as listeners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a way of, another way of taking ourselves seriously. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's one thing to have that idea, though, Jack. And, and again, I'm, I'm sort of curious about you as a as a writer. Your you know your practice. You have that idea. You're reading to your kids, and uh, you think, well, I, I want to turn this into a, you know an epic poem. But it's another thing to to get to the place that you arrived at. Um, you know, a, a lot of work clearly went into this. A lot of research, uh, which I want to ask you about. But um, Tell tell us a bit about your your practice in a sense. So I mean, you're a, you're a, an academic. You're a classical scholar. You teach at Dalhousie, and you you have full days, I imagine, doing that. Um, uh, sometimes a head full of of the wrong things, the sort of anti literature that only the academ the academy can conjure, uh, uh, politics and all that sort of thing. What 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 was your practice? if you had a regular one in terms of sort of getting this out from that ambition of, you know, reading to your kids to having this down on paper? Well, uh, it, uh, I sort of launched into it, I guess, after the, the kids had begun to sleep through the night properly, uh, but I was used to not getting as much sleep as I would have normally done before. And so I was able to get by my ordinary life by just working late into the night uh, after everyone else had gone to sleep and just coping with, uh, you know, four or five hours of sleep or six hours sleep in the normal way. And so, so I was basically done late at night. Um, the real challenge, I guess, was learning, from a technical point of view, was learning to handle blank verse uh, properly, which I'd always known about and appreciated and read, uh, but I never attempted anything big and long in blank verse. And uh, it was a bit of a, uh, Compromise, you might say, because I'd always dreamed of trying to find a meter, and I know we're not going to get into spondees and dactyls or anything, but a meter that was going to be as good as Homer's meter, the famous dactylic hexameter, being flexible and yet weighty. And I've, I kind of realized that I was not going to get it in this decade of my life. So I went back to blank verse, and uh, the first phase of it, I guess, was a bit slow because I was trying to learn how to handle that meter. Um, which is so flexible, but at the same time also can get away from you if you don't sort of keep it under control because it's apt to drift into prose if you don't uh, hold on to it. So that was the main um, technical 
challenge in the first phase. And then, uh, then it became just kind of a lifestyle to be working on it all the time. Well, the, the one poet I, I sort of felt right away when, you know, from the beginning was, was, was Milton. Um, did you, uh, uh, read Paradise Lost over and over? Did you absorb yourself in Milton? Uh, was that part of the process? Yeah, I'd always been a Milton fan. And uh, I definitely, I did read Paradise Lost straight through uh, as part of the first phase there just to kind of fully absorb his style. It's good um, shit, isn't it? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a good read. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, it's totally yeah. great. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's an incredible, it's you know, the greatest poetic monument in my, in my opinion in, in our language. And um, you know, there's a certain danger of being seduced into a full-on Miltonic style. I mean, you really wish you could get away with some of the things which he can trust his reader to follow him with in terms of the changing the position of adjectives and so forth and the sheer density of syntactic structure. Um, and uh, I did sort of dip into that sometimes for kind of cosmological materials sort of about the force. I would sort of be willing to have a nice big resonant Miltonic uh, line or, or two or three. Um, but at the same time, I also tried to study other blank verse traditions, uh, like um, James Thompson's nature poetry for um, scenes like Dagobah, or just trying to set the scene in nature any, anywhere, uh, Cloud City or Tatooine. Um, and, uh, and I guess, you know, I would sort of pick up Shakespeare just to kind of renew my, my love of, of his quick dialogue. Um, so uh, it was a mix and match of all different kinds of, of blank verse for me that way. Um, I hope it doesn't come across as too much of a, a sort of hodgepodge in that way. Um, but uh, that's something that you'd also see in ancient epic. There's a sort of amalgamation of different genres. Like in my um, excerpt I just read, it sort of ends with this lament. And uh, that's a kind of key subgenre of Homeric epic, the lament for the dead warrior, whether by an actual character or by the poet uh, himself, because the poet steps in every now and then and gives you a little kind of mini lament for a random Trojan who's just been killed by Achilles. He'll take two or three lines and say, and here was this guy, we're not gonna pass over him in silence. Here's two or three lines to give him an epitaph. And uh, that's uh, something I wanted to include where I could. Uh, there's not as much death in my poem as in the Iliad or even the Odyssey, but um, it's still uh, uh, you know, a little touch here and there that I try and include. Yeah, and I found I found those resonances really uh, excellent. I think you managed. I mean, I, the 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 concept of decorum, I guess that that classical rhetorical idea of staying within boundaries. Uh, I think what you you clearly uh, had had somewhere, if not at the front of your mind. Uh, you, you know, I think you're. It's a. Uh, uh, something I talk about often with, you know, what, what little teaching I do, it's something that I try to, to encourage people to, to focus on is, is, you know, knowing exactly the language uh, that defines the characters you're, you're working with and the, the milieu and everything else. And, and uh, I do think of that, that, that concept of decorum. Um, and I, I think you, uh, you nail it. It's great. Uh, less, less sort of lofty influences, I suppose, were the movies themselves. I mean, did you did you watch them over and over again? Or I, I think for a while I was certainly up there. I'm on the planet in terms of knowledge of the original three movies, not of the whole Star Wars universe by any means, but of the original trilogy movies. I knew I knew them frame by frame at one point. Um, actually bought a Trivial Pursuit Star Wars set and just thought we'd have fun as a family playing it. And uh, nobody wanted to play after the first <laughs> run through because I just got them all. But um, <laughs> yes, I would actually watch quite carefully uh, every scene and study the script and um, uh, there are different variations of them too. And because um, they've been re-edited a few times over the years. Um, so yeah, I, I would sometimes stick very closely to what's there. Like I actually prided myself in having the duel of Vader and Luke Skywalker on uh, Cloud City. Uh, the actual sequence of lightsaber cuts that they make at each other is actually <laughs> parallels very precisely the sequence of uh, stabs in the movie. And, uh, but other ones, other times I would, I would give myself free reign. Like the destruction of Alderaan in the movie takes, you know, three seconds, five seconds. Uh, in my passage there of 75 lines, like I really uh, indulge the opportunity to sort of include the lament, include a sort of extended description of how the planet's destroyed. And um, 
certain things I think a poem can do better than a movie. And that includes dwelling on the details like that. Um, a movie can't spend, or at least a commercial, uh, successful movie can't spend a, a long time meditating on each scene, uh, whereas a poem can either speed up or slow down and uh, try to do that uh, certain places. Other times I would go faster than in the movie. Um, you know, Luke racing down the trench uh, to destroy the Death Star uh, takes up a fairly long time in the movie. But for me, I wanted to get to the sort of conclusion of that or the main points of that as fast as possible just to save time for other uh, details. That, 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 that I wondered about because uh, uh, Star Wars uh, corporate people who are, who are tuned in uh, to this, I, I got a sense, Jack, uh, that you, you, you kind of have to mind your, uh, your approach sometimes in terms of what, what uh, the mothership has to say, uh, uh, whether that's, I don't know, your, the, the publisher or, or Lucasfilm or, or, or you, you, maybe you can, you can enlighten us about that. I'm just wondering what in terms of the choices you wanted to make as a, as a poet, uh, how, how often did you have to sort of test those against what uh, you were allowed to do? Maybe, maybe, maybe what you could do is, is just tell us about the process of, okay, I, 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 I was reading to my kids. I, uh, I, I love this idea. I started working hard at, at, at uh, making this, this Homeric version, uh, a Miltonic version, uh, but, I need to, I want to publish it. How do I get it published? What am I allowed to do with, with this material? Maybe you can tell us about how that process played out. Well, um, I'd initially thought after I'd finished uh, the first three books covering the original 1977 film that I would try and interest people in the Star Wars epic is coming, you know, and maybe we can do this as one volume and there'll be subsequent volumes. That's the way that uh, Ian, Ian Descher has done a, a Shakespearean version of Star Wars, and he goes film by film, pretty much, uh, keeping with the sort of Shakespearean uh, segmentation of episodes of, of some of Shakespeare's uh, long stories. And um, uh, so that was my first attempt. And uh, I think nobody could really believe that I was going to be doing the whole original trilogy. And so there wasn't a great deal of interest um, at that initial point. And then I kind of faced a fork in the roads, like, shall I go on? You know, am I even if there's potentially no real market for this, am I going to cover the next two films? And I decided, well, I'm enjoying doing this so much that even if it sits in the bottom of my drawer, you know, for another 150 years, uh, it's still worth doing. So I did the next two films. And at that point, once it was a complete sort of um, unity, uh, then thanks to a kind friend, I was put in touch with an agent and um, she was able to uh, 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 both find a publisher and then also negotiate the, um, somewhat complicated uh, process of, of getting Disney and Lucasfilm to sign off on it. Uh, then there was this editorial process in which there was... Can, can, no, can I interrupt yeah. you there for a second, Jack, and just can you give us any details about what that, what those complications were? I mean, what, what you know, in terms of Disney and, and Lucasfilm, what, what yeah. sorts of things they were sort of asking of you? Well, I mean, for me, uh, the way I think about the Star Wars universe is that it's a kind of um, evolving myth but uh, instead of having sort of a bunch of different uh, cities all sort of wrangling out what the real story of the Trojan War is going to be, there's hundreds of millions of people invested in what's going to happen in Star Wars. And so to kind of keep a rein on that and avoid just the whole thing spiraling away, uh, the Star Wars community as a whole, not just Disney and Lucasfilm, but Star Wars community is quite insistent upon the concept of canon, which is to say what is part of the official version of Star Wars and what is what is not, what is sort of on the margins or has been passed, passed by by the evolution of the story. Uh, so that's a serious concept for every, all stakeholders and including very much the fans. And the real benefit to me of the kind of editorial feedback that I got from um, Star Wars, uh, from Lucasfilm, was that they really know the fans very well. I mean, they deal with them uh, you know, all the time. And, and they are deeply immersed in canon, the details of it, but also in sort of how to uh, handle it. And uh, so several um, sort of oddities of mine, uh, sort of owing to the poetic tradition, they were perfectly delighted to include. So for example, I have a couple of examples of what's called ekphrasis, which is the description of a work of art in a poem as a way of sort of bringing in certain themes, uh, 
before Luke confronts the emperor at the end, there's a description of two statues in the emperor's throne room, which are not there in the movie. But um, they're there just to kind of add background about who the emperor is and what his history is. And that was something that they're perfectly happy to allow in as accommodating the genre of epic. But a couple of places- So, so I, let, let, let me interrupt you for a sec there, Jack. Uh, was someone uh, truly pouring over the manuscript in that detail saying, oh, these, these statues weren't, weren't in, the, in, in the film or in the canon, as you put it, uh, should, should we allow this? Was there, was there that, that level of well, attention? Yeah, it was quite carefully read by several true oh. experts uh, well. who would correct things like my spelling of like the most obscure planet in yeah. the whole universe. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd done pretty well, I think. Like I had researched it pretty thoroughly. And as you commented, there's a fair bit of detail in there used, yeah. you know, for epic effect as much as for gestures to obscure parts of the canon. But also um, to give you a sense of the depth of the Star Wars universe. Yeah. Sometimes I would misspell a planet and they would catch it. There's no, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very, uh, the Star Wars uh, both has a kind of official um, com compendium of knowledge, which is available online. And there's also a fan site called Wikipedia, which is just an incredible feat of human achievement. I mean, it's like, there's more articles about the Star Wars universe than many languages on Wikipedia have about the real world. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in great detail with enormous scholarship and footnoting and just cross-referencing. And it's just, you know, it makes a classicist's heart flutter just to watch it, you know? Uh, well, I mean, that's, great... that, that, that's fascinating to me as a, just as a writer, because that level of editorial detail really is a is a, a, a bygone feature of of, of my world. I mean, uh, uh, you know, editors like that. Uh, it's not that they don't exist. Let let's say, but uh, the job of editors these days, especially in, in larger publishing houses, is so um, you know, it's it's, it's to do with uh, larger things than <laughs> than the text. Uh, and you know, I, I I as someone who does care about details. Uh, love it when people engage at that at that kind of level, um, and, and it sounds like you do too as a as a as a writer yourself. Uh, yeah, it, it sounds, it sounds kind really, of kind of fun. Yeah, it, it may sound counterintuitive to say like I loved being subject to intense editorial control, um, and there were no conflicts. But uh, but um, uh, but strange enough, it was actually quite liberating. I found to kind of know I had the true expert audience here reading. The poem very carefully uh and and i could trust in a sense when it came out on the other end that uh it had passed that serious test and i tried to imagine it in terms of the the judges that used to adjudicate the homeric performances in athens mm -hmm. they would have these competitions to see who could recite the Iliad and odyssey best and there were apparently quite serious regulations about whether you could depart and include something wild and crazy like this time odysseus uh yeah, he doesn't take build a raft. He builds a boat. You're like, no, you cannot. You cannot change the boat. You know, you cannot change the raft. So uh, I like that um, that collaboration. You might say between the tradition and then the person participating in the tradition. Uh, maybe feel yeah, kind of well, much more at home, much less lost in the sea of of creativity. That's it. I mean, that's that's big. That's that's you know, you know, you have an audience, uh, and that uh, when you when I go back to that question of of why, you know, when you're when you're writing, why am I doing this? God help me. Uh, uh, to have an a, a attentive, very uh, particular uh, group of people out there who you know will will appreciate this is. There's comfort in it, um, for sure. I mean, I think that's yeah, that's great. Let me let me just ask you about about the canon uh, because you know I, I I had passages ready, but uh, my eyesight's so bad I can't <laughs> read them right now. Uh, uh, your your attention to detail is is astonishing, and and these these names that uh, you you conjure the names of of planets and and. And, and cities and characters and, and, and histories. Um, you know, I, as someone who, you know, was as a kid, a big fan of these movies and knew them frame by frame as a kid, uh, I didn't know, you know, a, a hundredth of the, of the details that you, you uh, elicit. And, and, and I was just wondering what that canon is exactly, where, where are you? What are the source materials for you for this? 
written, I guess. I mean, not I mean, beyond the movies. What, where, where are you going for these amazing lists of pilots and 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 places and things? Well, I I, I have sort of dipped my toe, you might say, in the vast ocean of non movie Star Wars uh, canon material. There's an even larger ocean of non-canon Star Wars material, uh, which was um, sort of turned into a category called Legends, a kind of non-canon corpus um, uh, about nine years ago. Uh, for me, just I will dip my toe in, as I say, I, I, I have a certain collection and I've certainly read um, a certain proportion of the comic books and novels and so forth. But uh, because of the level of detail present, um, although there are Star Wars fans out there who are in the process of noticing uh, out of their own sheer expertise, uh, the sources of some of these things, I must admit that for me, I relied mostly on sort of secondary material like um, official Star Wars, Holocron and the, and the um, uh, and Wikipedia. So I would double check the references to make sure that I was correct and the article was right. Um, but, um, but I rely, I, st I stood on the shoulders of giants, you might say, of, of the in the Star Wars community who'd done the hard work of research uh, for me. Um, so for example, if I needed a simile for a blowpipe, uh, I would look up, okay, how can I find a Star Wars blowpipe? And it should, to, lo and behold, someone has used a Star Wars blowpipe and I could have an in-universe simile uh, that features a blowpipe. So that was, uh, it, it's just so vast. I mean, um, it's, it's as large as the, as the corpus of Greek mythology at this point. And, uh, I didn't have a lifetime to reinvest in Star Wars after having invested in ancient literature, but uh, at the same time, uh, it, it becomes a you know, second nature to just kind of double check your sources carefully. So that's where most of all that sort of those uh, catalogs and so forth come from is from um, well, certain resources like the uh, Essential Atlas describes the the galaxy of Star Wars carefully, and so I could double check that my starships were moving in the right direction as they passed certain. Uh, Star Wars uh, constellations and so forth, but uh, so there was a lot of a lot of painstaking detail. But uh, that's the kind of thing I'm used to as a classicist. Yeah, well, and like I said, I mean, what one effect of it is that it it feels like this act of of love. I mean, it, it's you 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 embrace this universe in such detail that uh, you know I think a reader a reader really appreciates that. Um, if if you know not feeling overwhelmed by it, so, <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, but that's that's part of, of, of good literature, I think. Um, uh, just just going back, I don't want to run out of time. Uh, thinking about your kids and and thinking about this, you know, reading reading it aloud and 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 so on. That that act in itself, I think, as Grace suggested, you know, conjures a. Uh, the, the the very history that you're that you're trying to to situate this in uh, this whole oral oral tradition, um, you know stories being you know older than older than uh, the written word and and I think every day about how stories really define human beings. I mean, as a species, we 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 rely on. On, on stories, both as as guidance, you know, for getting through all, all kinds of uh, uh, stages of life. Um, but but even you know, I can't I can't look at an object at, at the age I'm at now without remembering something, you know, and 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 there being a story behind everything I look at, um, and that comes from a helpful place. Uh, it can it can also be dangerous. Uh, you know, lead us to, you know, I think, you know, buying into fiction too much, I think has its, has its pitfalls. Uh, but uh, I, I just, the, the, I guess my, my question is what, in a sense, uh, if, if there's an answer, did you sort of, what's the, what's the benefit for you of, 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 of doing this? Of, of engaging with this oral tradition and really what's what's the what does it mean for you as a father uh, to to do this stuff well i guess fundamentally my commitment is to sort of showing uh and participating in the ongoing proof that sort of beautiful language is a fundamental human trait and that this is something that we have to cultivate i mean it's language is instinctive for us of course as a species but um, it's also something which is uh, transmitted and, and, uh, and uh, continuous uh, from generation to generation. 
And, you know, we can sort of get out of the habit, I think, of using deliberately beautiful language if we don't work at it. And one of the things that I love about the ancient world is just how much they loved reading aloud, even if they had sort of left some of their more professionalized oral traditions behind, they were still constantly reading books to each other. Uh, it was a natural way to read a book was to read, have it read to you or read it to somebody else. And we have a bit of that with audiobooks nowadays. We like to listen to books more than we used to do 20 years ago. But I think there's something about the human connection between one person reading a book to another and reading and inhabiting that book uh, that uh, binds the human community together and is a sort of acceptable substitute, you might say, for the, the perhaps even deeper tradition of storytelling in a pre-literate culture in which uh, the authority of the tradition in the past in the form of a storyteller um, you know, was, was probably a constant uh, constant element binding a community together in the evenings or in the winter months and uh, books for us fulfill that role but I think it helps if we have a book uh, and, a, and a tradition which is um, enjoyable to read out loud so I wanted to create a text which I would enjoy reading to my kids uh, as much as they loved hearing it and I, I've read a lot of books to them over the years but um, I wanted to want to meet them halfway you might say with a um, a poem that I liked reading myself. And what better, what better book to read to your kids than your own book? <laughs> well, I wish I could read mine to my kids. <laughs> my daughter just started <laughs> dipping into my first novel and she was <laughs> criticizing all my swearing. <laughs> um, so I guess, I guess in a way, what, what the question that raises for me is, is, is there something within the Star Wars story itself that you find you know, it's it's. I, I totally agree with and, and and admire your you know the ambition to to uh, speak beautifully and, and think think linguistically in a sense. You know, to have that sort of higher consciousness of of the words you're using. Um, but is there something with sort of morally, I suppose, within the Star Wars stories that that is also what you wanted to impart to your kids? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a different moral universe than the ancient world that I'm more used to. Uh, it's definitely one which is more a sort of Manichaean good versus evil uh, without any much further ado. I mean, the, the Jedi, the, the good guys are, are a bit more morally ambiguous, but the bad guys, for the most part, are pretty more, you know, unambiguously evil as such. And once you start down the dark path forever, it will, it will dominate your destiny without much other explanation provided. So I tried to kind of add some sort of moral element to that basic clash between good and evil, um, a bit more uh, sort of infusing a bit of more ancient um, morality to it, you might say. But fundamentally, it is different from the kind of clash of um, similar uh, enemies in uh, enemies who are similar to each other in the Iliad. I mean, Odysseus doesn't claim to be morally better than his the mass suitors he massacres, except insofar as they have infringed upon his rights. Uh, Achilles and Hector are peers, ultimately. Um, that's not the case with uh, Yoda versus the emperor, that one is evil and one is good. So it's a bit different that way. But at the heart of it, uh, which is the redemption of Darth Vader, Anakin Skywalker, uh, through the recognition of his son and of his own uh, fall from, from grace, you might say, uh, that redemptive story, I think, is um, basically about the sort of potential for good even inside the worst person and that is something which i certainly um cling to um whether it's true or not <laughs> well i don't know but it's certainly a nice story to to read about and uh and i think that's a, a great um hero's journey people talk about the hero's journey of of luke skywalker of course who goes off to seek his destiny like telemachus in the odyssey but the the ultimate hero's journey in the in the first six films is that of Anakin Skywalker and his fall and then his, his redemption. And uh, perhaps you might say it's a kind of older person's hero's journey as opposed to the young person's journey of his son, Luke. Well, journey is something that I, I like to think about uh, in terms of, of the Odyssey and, and what, uh, what, what your book did for me was 
bring alive parts of myself. I think I told you already, you know, part of that was remembering all this classical stuff that I, that I studied for so long that I've buried uh, studiously uh, in, in my own way. Uh, um, I, I remember going to see uh, Star Wars with my brother. I was living in England. I was, I guess, I guess seven years old. Uh, you know, I remember that day vividly, and 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 uh, I felt that again, uh, looking at this, which was which was fun. You know, remembering uh, wanting to play uh, Luke all the time to my brother's Darth, and uh, uh, but I remember too the first time I read the Odyssey, and I I, I guess I was in high school, and and. Uh, just being, you know, just loving the story of it, you know. I mean, forget all the, all the stuff that we ended up uh, poisoning ourselves with as as as, as students. Uh, the story is just it was just so fun. I loved the journey of it. Mm -hmm. um, I I, uh, I saw a photo of you uh, on a on a motorbike uh, going cross country somewhere. I think. Uh, uh, did the Odyssey sort of have any effect on you as a young man, as a uh, as a writer, as a person? Uh, was that something that that was at the heart of this as well? I mean, it's called the Odyssey of Star Wars, I suppose. You know. Yes, I've always um, I've always been sort of committed to the great journey, you might say, whether whether it's a physical journey across Canada, as I did a couple times with my actually I have my uh, my my performance staff from that trip. <laughs> uh, still have it down here um it's uh it's you know the physical journey and then also the sort of the moral journey of being willing to sort of cast your raft out from the island and leave behind the pleasant uh embraces of calypso as you might say the kind of op opportunity for immortality you know on her uh, terms in terms of a nymph and instead to kind of seek one's true self and one's true uh real meaning of one's whole life in Odysseus' case, by going home and giving up immortality, giving up Calypso for Penelope and Telemachus in his roles as a husband and father and king, and uh, he does so, you know, knowing that it's it's going to it's pretty risky business to setting your raft up on the sea, but uh, uh, and of course he may think that he's close by, but in fact he then gets blown off course again and has a whole other slew of adventures, in addition to the ones he's already had that left him on Calypso's island in the first place, so. I mean, there's a, there's a famous poem of uh, Kavafi's um, uh, called Ithaca, uh, which exhorts the reader to enjoy the journey and, uh, and relish your own odyssey. And I never quite bought it, to be honest, because part of the problem, part of, like a real journey is one that you face even though you know it's going to be hell. <laughs> you know, you know, on some level, it's going to be extremely difficult, like I'm riding a motorcycle across the country. But it's, um, you do it anyway. Uh, because uh, you're sort of summoned to try and find whatever you're looking for, whether it be yourself or the truth or some artistic achievement or just um, uh, you know whatever duty calls. And that um, that's something that's definitely been always part of who I am, and I'm sure conditioned by uh, having that be the sort of automatic response in the Odyssey to these challenges. To uh, to strive to seek to find and not to yield. Eh? Yeah, that's he, he, even after he's come home. That's right. Yeah. He'll head off into the yeah. uh, into the future. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's a good place to 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 pause for for questions. Um, and uh, I, I I I do want to encourage everyone to uh, to buy your book and uh, and rekindle these parts of themselves as well. So uh, thanks for writing it. Thanks for uh, thanks for taking that journey. Oh, thanks for thanks for the wonderful uh, uh, conversation. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you both. So I am. I have a few questions for you that have come up. Um, uh, so let me pull them up here. I've got a, a question here. Um, just noting that it was such a plum in the transition to movie, from movie to poem. Um, but does epic language pose a challenge to describing female characters? It seems like the Iliad's best descriptions of, are of male characters. Um, I, I don't know if it's inherently uh, more difficult to describe a uh, female than a male character. Uh, certainly not for me. Um, the Star Wars films, I mean, like 
like a lot of adventure films, um, skew male in terms of the number of, of characters, but um, a bit like Homer too, uh, some of the chief roles end up being female ones as well. Uh, there's not many human female characters in the Iliad, but there are some fantastic female divine characters. And uh, some of the best um, personalities, I think, are those of Hera and, uh, sorry, Hera, uh, and, and, and Athena and to some extent Aphrodite, especially Athena. Um, and so too in the Odyssey, um, she's really the principal divine figure. Um, I don't know. I mean, the Iliad's bloodthirstiness is definitely presented as a, a male sphere. Um, although a definite does just wander in one point to the battle. Um, but uh, so, so I think for that reason, we tend to associate uh, the Iliad with sort of a male idea, but, um, but Penelope is a, a very important figure in the Odyssey. So um, you know, given how patriarchal ancient Greece was, it's, it's actually reasonably impressive that there are as subtle portraits of women in, uh, or female characters, at least in, in Homer as there are. Um, you touched on this earlier, um, but uh, we have a question um, from uh, uh, Joy, who's curious to know how you manage the copyright aspects of writing a story that is such a big property and an owned property. Um, how, how did that, how did you work that? Well, uh, um, basically by throwing oneself on the goodwill and mercy of Disney and Lucasfilm and saying, you know, wouldn't it be a great idea to have an epic poem of Star Wars? And uh, I think if it hadn't been for the just goodwill of people uh, who could make those decisions, uh, uh, would not probably have seen 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 the light, uh, given the the difficulty of negotiating in that regard. Um, but um, you know, every, everything is 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 possible provided that one gets the um, the green light from the the fairly powerful corporation that controls the, the rights to Star Wars. Basically, you, you were creating a, a poetic adaptation of a story, and so you needed permission. Yes, I, I, this couldn't have happened without, um, without uh, permission being granted by Lucasfilm and, and Disney. Uh, and they're, they're on the back of the, the book just to prove that I'm not uh, attempting to- And we're very glad they did. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> So uh, good, good call, good call, uh, <laughs> Disney Lucasfilms. Um, did you develop any epithets for your story? And if you did, can you share some of them and maybe explain what an epithet is in this context? So an epithet in epic poetry is an adjective that gets attached to a character's name and uh, serves to be a sort of shorthand for that character. And especially in Homeric poetry, it um, it sort of encapsulates in a single word one essential characteristic of that hero. So Achilles is always is frequently swift-footed, but sometimes he's also swift-footed godlike Achilles if the line needs a bit more space. And they're all sort of uh, characteristics of a hero that, that um, uh, fulfill the compositional requirements of a traditional art form. Now that then gets kind of taken into the literary form of epic, uh, say in Virgil, where in order to evoke the Homeric atmosphere, he'll also use certain epithets. So Aeneas is always pious Aeneas or pious Aeneas, dutiful Aeneas. Um, well, not all well, he's often that. And so it's more in that sort of Virgilian spirit uh, because I, I'm not drawing on a traditional um, formulaic style of epic for this poem uh, that I do attach a lot of uh, epithets. I mean, I'd have to, um, like uh, Tarkin is often grim, for example. Um, uh, proud Chewbacca. Uh, basically, if I if I can, if there's a space, I will use the same adjective that way for Chewbacca. Um, I'm not sure I would call him, for example, proud Chewie. Uh, that wouldn't sort of suit his dignity as Chewbacca the Wookiee. But uh, where I need to have a syllable there, just with one adjective, I'll call him proud Chewbacca consistently uh, to kind of sort of give the sense that there's a, a poetic depth, you might say, to the presentation of this character from the beginning to the end. Even though sometimes he might not be proud. There are certain Greek poems where like Theseus will dive into the ocean and he's called the bronze corseleted Theseus. And you're like, how can he dive into the ocean if he's wearing a bronze corslet? Uh, but the answer is that he's always bronze corseleted Theseus, even when he's not wearing a bronze corslet. Uh, 
Um, so it's sort of part of the essential characteristics of his heroic status. So ancient, ancient identity politics. There you go, there you go. Or like at least a kind of a um, uh, Twitter bio for each board. <laughs> okay. So here's a question. Um, typically, you would get a screenwriter adapting a book to the screen. So this is going in reverse plus. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, there, there, uh, certainly a screenwriter will have techniques about taking a book and, and finding the cinematic scenes that tell the story. Um, when you're going in reverse, uh, what, what did you learn about, uh, in, in, through that process? Well, I learned that um, dialogue to be effective on the screen uh, is often quite short, whereas uh, to communicate everything that an actor brings to a scene and the director adds and the, the costumes and everything add, um, everything has to be done verbally. And so I would often have to take three or four lines of like three or four words of dialogue and turn that into a small speech, uh, adding in the atmosphere, that, at least as I perceive it on the screen. So it was more a question, I think, of lengthening the dialogue and then uh, adding in just as much sort of background material as is necessary to continue the story. So expansion of some elements and then compre compression of others. I used to, I used to uh, fantasize that in fact, the films I was studying as I was composing it were uh, adaptate, would be perceived by future centuries as brilliant adaptations of the original poem. Uh, and that, uh, the director had just done a tremendous job of capturing what the poem said. It was the best adaptation to the screen ever, really. That's a lovely thought. That's a lovely thought. Um, I, I wondered when, and this is a question for me actually, um, I wonder when you, when you dove into the writing of this poem um, with your classical background, um, we know that the Star Wars saga um, drank deep at the well of, uh, of myth, um, uh, millennia of uh, human myth. You must have stumbled on um, uh, el elements that that really um, that had a clear correspondence to the Homeric tradition. I I'm thinking, for example, the focus on the, the father, um, Odysseus, and many other heroes in in the, in the classical tradition go and visit the shades of their father. And um, so I, I, I wonder how often you ran into something of that nature in this process. Yeah, I mean, the, the deeper you gaze, I think, into the, into the mirror of the Star Wars trilogy um, and the whole universe, um, especially those components which are, are directly conceived by George Lucas, who was so profoundly influenced by Joseph Campbell's um, studies of mythology, world mythology. Uh, the more elements you recognize in that regard, for sure, like things like Luke going into the cave on Dagobah and then confronting the specter of his father, who he has to he momentarily tries to fight, cuts the head off and recognizes his own face underneath. I mean, uh, you just feel there must be some direct Mayan myth somewhere that this is a direct uh, copy of. Um, but I think it's because it speaks to these sort of universal sort of Jungian uh, ideas of myth as psychology that uh, inform art quite successfully when they when they are used. Um, so there were a fair number of those types of things. Um, as a practical matter for an epic poet, besides the thematic element um, of say the father and, and the son, uh, just to be able to have an epic poem where the two main characters fight each other physically uh, was a great relief after treating the Battle of the Plains of Abraham and sort of more contemporary historical material. Um, you know, if you Adam, were to do a, a epic of World War II. I mean, you're never going to have Stalin and Hitler meeting on the battlefield and fighting a duel with pistols or anything like that. I mean, it would be just absurd and, and mock epic. Um, so you lack that ability to, to bring the two heroes into direct physical confrontation uh, in a historical work or my Moncom and Wolf, where they may both die in the battle, but they don't kill each other. They, they die separately in different parts of the battlefield. So uh, it was great to have 
Luke and Vader be able to actually fight hand to hand because <laughs> you can interrupt the physical drama with the, the moral confrontation of the two figures and in terms of you know, closely related family figures. And um, that's a nice um, uh, interplay, you might say, of, of, um, uh, of the physical and the moral. Jack, yeah. I have two questions that have come in from the audience. Um, someone has asked whether there's any chance that the book will be available in a digital format. And they've added Apple Books, I hope, just so that you know. And the second question, is there any chance of it being made into an audio book? Uh, well, which I think that's a great idea. Two great questions. Um, I'm, I'm not up to date and I, I am not being coy, but I just do not know uh, what the status is of, the di of a digital edition. Um, I, I'm not certain why, why there isn't one, but um, uh, that would be sort of in the hands of the publisher. And uh, I, I just don't know the details of it. Um, uh, there's been uh, sort of thoughts raised about an audiobook, but I think it would depend upon um, whether the poem succeeds uh, commercially or not. Um, I think if there's, if it's thought that there's going to be, there would be an audience for an audiobook version, I think people would be amenable to it. Um, I think it'd be great for an audiobook. Uh, <laughs> I, I love listening to different versions of Paradise Lost and narrative poetry in general on audiobook. Uh, I'm not sure I'm the one to necessarily read it. <laughs> I think we need to have a skillful actor to do it. But um, it certainly is something which was intended by me to be suitable for an audiobook. And uh, I hope I hope that will happen. But uh, I, again, I just I just don't know the details. I hope so too. I hope so too. There are a couple more questions, which I, uh, good questions, which I'd like to ask if we can go a little bit over our time. Um, the first is, uh, did your attitude to any of the Star Wars characters change as you internalize them for your own creation? Yeah. Uh, um, and I'll give you the second one too, um, since time is short. And um, you, of course, you've mentioned the value of beautiful language with which we all agree wholeheartedly. Um, this being said, did you consider that your work would perhaps introduce kids to epic poetry? Uh, just to answer the second question first, uh, yes, I definitely hope that this is an introduction for kids, whether they're quite young. Uh, I know I've had a couple of readers who were like far younger than you'd think would be interested in epic poetry, um, but who haven't been taught that it's not natural to listen to, to narrative verse and so are perfectly prepared to take it on board. Uh, so yes, yes, um, but also teenagers. I hope that um, teenagers who are sort of somehow skeptical about reading uh, traditional verse would recognize in this sort of a story which they can identify with and uh, know right away and be able to follow along naturally. So I, I do hope there's a sort of missionary purpose in that. Definitely, that's one of my main uh, ideas for sure with this poem. Uh, as to characters I discovered more about? Well, a few of them, but the one that stands out is Princess Leia. I never realized at all how hardcore she was. Um, I mean, I knew she was hardcore, but uh, the, the degree to which she has this sort of intense ferocity uh, in, in her actions, um, I think uh, blows me away <laughs> the more that I watch, watch the poems. I tried to do justice to it in, especially her, her, her killing of Jabba the Hutt, uh, which is a uh, sort of heroic feat in, in the movies, but which again only has a few seconds to take place. And so uh, I tried to kind of extend it a bit and uh, use it to kind of point out that her character, uh, although very much the heart and soul of the whole rebellion, also has this potential danger in it of the dark side. And then when Vader therefore threatens, Star Wars fans will know, threatens Luke with the potential that Leia will become uh, his apprentice and his next dark side uh, Sith princess, uh, that that then sends Luke into this kind of rage against the thought that Leia could become that. But the more that I sort of studied Leia's character in the films, the more I thought, well, actually, there's a real potential there in Leia for both good and bad, much like her father. And perhaps she's more like Anakin in many ways than Luke is. I'm a, we're going to have to wrap up, I'm afraid, although I have to tell you that the last question that came in is going to make you laugh. Will the poem be made into a movie is the question. <laughs> <laughs> a very art, a very art, art house movie. <laughs> right. 
anyway, um, everyone, I hope that you found this as inspiring as I did. You you may, as I do, want to go and rewatch the entire Star Wars canon and go and read <laughs> Homer and Virgil in the original, as if I could do that in my dreams. Oh. I, I'd like to thank Colin and Jack for a great conversation. And I, I'd like to thank our tech help, Tio Armory, and our staff, Teresa Johnson and Brendan DeCaries. And um, everybody do look out for Jack's book, The Odyssey of Star Wars, at the bookstore, and watch for Colin McCadden's latest book, De Black Dove, which you should see on the shelves in 2022. And I'd like to last, uh, but not least, invite you all to go to the Pen Canada website to learn more about what Pen Canada does. Join as a member, donate to the cause. We'd love to have you. Thank you for your attention and good night. Thank you, Grace. Good Thank night. you, Colin. Thank you, guys. Good night. You weren't tempted, Jack, to uh, hum through that, I suppose. Eh? Just don't want to scare anybody. <laughs> well, I'm going to sign off. Uh, thank you so much. I, I don't know how public this is right now, but uh, I'm going to stop the recording now. Yeah.